Hey robot makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So, do you want to set up your Raspberry Pi for use with ROS and Docker but not know don't know where to start? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. So this is kind of unofficially part two of the Learn ROS With Me series. Okay, let's get over to our keynote and make a start, shall we? So yes, this is all about setting up your Raspberry Pi for use with ROS. Okay. So, in this session, we're going to look at exactly how to do that. We're going to install a 64-bit version of the Raspberry Pi OS, uh, which is the supported configuration from the Open um, Open Source Robot Foundation who create uh, ROS. We're going to install Docker to keep things nice and tidy. Uh, we're going to build our ROS container um, within... Uh, the Raspberry Pi 64-bit in Docker, and then we're going to run that container. We're going to have a, look, have a look around, see how this all works, and then we're going to have a very short demo to see how we can write our first ROS program. There's quite a lot to cram into this, so let's uh, see what we can do. And if you're sticking around for the live stream, there will be a, a bit of a mailbox slash Q&A at the end, so we can sort of hang out there as well. Okay. So the setup process, this is how it's going to work. And it's going to be quite uh, hands-on today. So I'm going to show you stuff uh, in the terminal and uh, how we build various different things. So I shouldn't be really dropping anything in this, this episode, though I did manage to drop this little thermal camera that I was uh, just showcasing at the very start of the, uh, the, the session there. So the setup process, uh, a couple of steps involved in it. So last week we looked at how to design and build our robot. And our robot is just sat on my desk here. It's kind of got its LiDAR spinning around there. And I've uh, finished this sort of physical build of this. It's got its side and its back off. Well, yeah, side up front and its back off. And there the sort of pieces that uh, fit into place there. And um, yes, that's that's all from last week. Okay, so let's get back over to here. Uh, so this week we're going to be setting up the Raspberry Pi 4 environment. We're going to be installing Docker. It sounds exciting. <laughs> we're going to be cloning the repository for QB1, which is the robot there, because that's got a few helper files in there that'll help make this a much slicker and quick process. We're going to build our ROS2 environment. We're going to set up Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to do something really cool with Visual Studio. You can remotely connect to your Raspberry Pi and the container within that Raspberry Pi and run and debug your code. You can do that all from your sort of master computer. So it's pretty cool. So I've got to install the Docker uh, Explorer and Docker container modules for Visual Studio Code. And then in, in future episodes, we'll look at how to enhance our robots, how to get this LiDAR uh, actually working with our code, setting up the motors. And then the thing I'm really looking forward to, which is getting the mapping and navigation, simultaneous location and mapping work in SLAM. So that's where we're heading. That's the sort of direction. So first of all, we need to get into installing our 64-bit OS. So let me bring up um, the piece of software we're going to be using to do this. So if I go over to here. So Raspberry Pi have this uh, uh, this piece of software which is called the Raspberry Pi Imager. And this allows you to get your little SD card such as this one here. And you can then choose which operating system you want to flash onto this. You can then write that and you can also change some of the settings. So what I'm going to show you is how I would do this. Um, we don't actually need to do this today because I've already installed the 64-bit OS on my test machine. And I've also got the full thing running on the, the robot on the desk as well. So if I just back up one second, I'm just going to load up a browser because I want to show you something on here. So let me go over here and show you this. So this is, um, let me just move this up the little window that you can't see out the way. There we go. So this is my Kev's Robot uh, website. And on here, um, I've just added something this afternoon, which is in the Learn modules. There's, there's, a new, there's a new course, Learn ROS With Me. So this is a work in progress. So there's probably some bit rough edges and uh, bits and pieces missing there. And... Um, uh, but it has all the things I want to go through today. So we can use this as a kind of, a, instead of the slides, we can go through this instead. So the very first thing we want to do is set up our Raspberry Pi. So what it says on here is we're going to set up the 64-bit OS. Now, the reason that we want the 64-bit version and not the 32-bit version, one of them is simply to do with the amount of memory that 32-bit computers can address, which I think it's limited to about 4 gigs. And the reason for that is if you get a 32-bit number, you stretch it out in binary, the maximum number that you can have on there is something like 4,000 million, uh, whatever the, the RAM size is, that 4 gig. So is that 4,000 million billion or something? Whatever the number is, that's the maximum capacity that you can address with a 32-bit number. So if you have a 64-bit number, that's astronomically larger. It's more than more 
particles than there are in the universe uh, that you can store in a 64-bit number. They're very, very large. So that means we can we can address at least 8 gigs of RAM, which is what we've got in our Raspberry Pi 4 on the desk. And I've got one behind me as well, which is uh, just there, that little red and white box just there. That's the one we're going to be running in a second. So when you get a Raspberry Pi out the box, they tend to come with the 32-bit version of the operating system installed. So what we need to do is just wipe that and start again afresh uh, using this Raspberry Pi imaging tool. So if you want to grab hold of that, you can go over to raspberrypi.com. Let's just open that in a new window there. And you can see there there's, uh, there's links to how to download that. And they've got that for macOS, Windows and Ubuntu as well. And you can also install it if you're on... Um, well, I think that's probably Ubuntu Linux. You can just do sudo add install rpi-imager. And that will load up this this tool here okay so let's get back over here and what we want to do if i just load up this here when you click on this button here you can choose by default the 32-bit one we don't want that one we want the 64-bit one that's hidden underneath this raspberry pi os other so there it is raspberry pi os 64-bit the port of debian bullseye for raspberry pi desktops compatible with the 3 4 and 400 and it was last updated last when's that last august is that so we can click on that that's now selected you then choose the storage so if i get my little um memory card here i think this one is a is it a third i think it's a 16 gig this is the one that came with the raspberry pi actually so i'm just gonna plug this in got a little memory card reader just behind my screen okay and there's a question from the audience there just about uh, are there any still any disadvantages with the 64-bit kernel um, if there are it's not something that we're going to co come up against when we use ROS. so you can interchangeably if you've got more than one memory card you can just swap them in and out that's one of the beauties of using sd cards makes things a little bit simpler right so i've just popped in there that mass storage device which is this one here so that's there and then there's this little cog just down here if we click on this cog we can then choose a couple of options so we want to give our robot a name i'm just calling this one qb2 i've got qb1 on the desk and i've got qb2 which is behind me which is just a, another raspberry pi 4 8 gig and we want to make sure the ssh is enabled and we can use password authentication for that you can even set up a um username and password and i recommend that you do this so don't use pi that's considered to be um, a known user account so use one that um, that isn't pi so i use kev set your password in there you can then configure your wireless lan this helps as well if you're having a robot that's headless that hasn't got a monitor attached to it uh, and you can type your password in for your ssid there and i think you have to set your lan country as well and you can also set things like the locales and whatnot so click on save that and then you can click write and then it'll then ask you to sort of uh, start burning that there we go so we're not going to sit here and watch what the, watch this happen it's far too exciting for that so once that's done i'll just scroll down here it says the same kind of things on here we can then go to the next page which is about installing updates so once we put our raspberry pi uh, sd card in our raspberry pi we booted it up we can connect to it over the network so I've also got another machine over here. This is QB2. And the first thing that we want to do on here is just do sudo apt uh, install. Sorry, sudo apt update. I've got my notes literally in front of me there. So what that's going to do, it's going to go on to um, the Debian repository where it keeps all its um, updates and things. And it's just going to get the latest snapshot of that. And then you can also do upgrade as well i'm just going to skip that one because that might take a while to do that but that's the next step that you should do and you can see there it says there's 108 packages that can be upgraded so would be a good idea to do that too um, now if you if you want to use this um, and you want to have the the desktop you want to connect it over vnc what you'll have to do is do sudo uh, raspy config like sit like so and then you can choose the interface options and you can say VNC um, enable it and that will enable the VNC server so you then you can connect to it using something like VNC viewer so if I go over here and do I think it's 205 I'm going to go for there we go and we're now connected to that that QB2 you can see there QB2 at the top I find sometimes this can be a little bit laggy so I'm not going to use this for this particular session if I open up a terminal window there for example it's just a little bit slow and i think that's probably to do with the wireless network that it's connecting over it's just a little bit a uh, little bit slow there so yeah you see there a little bit laggy to, to do anything so i'm not going to use that but you can do if you want to and the other thing you can see on here as well is there's this little circle with a download um 
icon here and if you go show updates I click on that it'll show you all the updates that are sort of pending that can be installed now that's probably not going to pop up immediately when you put your SD card in it will take a little while for that to um, to show up just because it it doesn't load all the time so I'm just going to close that close that and I'm just going to come out of here as well okay so back over here so let's imagine we've uh, we've run those two commands we've done our sudo apt update sudo apt upgrade and we've also seen that we can install the updates as well from that little uh, um, download icon on the menu bar okay so next up we are going to install and configure docker so docker have made this really easy to install now i sometimes i've found that even on a fresh installation you might have um, an old version of docker installed so there's a way that we can actually get rid of get rid of that but what i'm going to do i'm just going to copy this uh, command here and i'm going to go back to my terminal I'm going to paste this in now this this file already exists so it should probably just overwrite it so curl is um, it's essentially like a tool that will grab um, a file onto your Unix machine so it's a bit like a web browser but it it works in the terminal it can just download things so if I do ls I can see there get docker.sh is there now currently if I try and run that .sh um, it's not going to allow you to run it because it needs to have an execute permission so the next thing that we need to do is just change the mode um, plus x means plus the execute command and then we want to just change get dash docker sh so now when we do ls you can see it's changed green and that means that we can now run that command to get docker um, now if i run this it will actually tell me i've already run this because i have already run it i wanted to do it before the show because it can take sometimes a little while and you really don't want to sit there just while it installs something but trust me that's all you need to do to install docker it's very very straightforward now there are some extra steps to installing docker you can see there we've done the uh, the plus x to uh, change the execute permission if you want to get rid of docker completely all traces then you can use this purge command so you do sudo apt-get um, purge docker dash ce docker dash ce cli which is like the command line interface container d io and then dash y just means just do it so that's the way that we can um, we can wipe it if we make any mistakes and then just to run the installer is just do dot forward slash get docker dot sh nice and simple okay so um, what we want to do next is so docker will run but we want it to run in kind of user mode so what we need to do is just add a few extra permissions here so what we want to do is we want to um, add the user whichever user we're currently using so it's actually not pi in this case it's kev we want to modify the docker account so that it, it also is included um, so essentially kev can run docker commands that's what that command will do so you simply just copy that um, and paste it so if I just do that now I think on the I've literally just updated this page a couple of seconds ago um, but it hasn't refreshed yet because if you try and run that as it is it'll just say you, you haven't got permission to do that you need to do sudo and another quick tip as well do you know if you're if you pasted something in and you're at the very end of the line and you have to sort of backspace you can just press con, uh, control and a and it'll jump to the very beginning of the, the line which is quite useful so and then if we just do kev what it'll do is it'll just make sure that we're added to the group that can run docker commands so we can now do things like docker ps and we can see if there's anything actually running which there isn't at the moment okay so next up we we need to change um, another thing which is we need to unmask it so i'm just going to copy that command paste that in so sudo system control system control allows you to manage the services that are running on your unix machine um so unmasking docker I'm not actually sure what that does if i'm 100 percent uh, honest right the next one we need to change the docker sock so let's do that one so change mode changes permissions so this is going to change permissions on the the uh, var run docker sock and that's the um, again we need to do sudo to to do that and then the very last thing we need to do second to last thing we need to do is we need to install um, docker compose now i've already installed this so it shouldn't take very long if you run these commands and you've already done it essentially it just it, it's fine um is it idempotent that's called it'll just um, carry on which is fine so we can now do things like docker compose which we'll be using in a minute so that'll just show you the different commands that you can run um okay next up is system control 
and start docker uh, I think we actually have it already running on here oops so I just paste that in um, if the service wasn't already started this would start it back up and then the last command that we need to do really is reboot the terminal because um, we want to just make sure that docker is running properly and there's no issues there so we don't need to do that on my particular case because i've already done that so next up um we were going to download some QB files so i've created a whole bunch of kind of tutorials and um, helper files and i've stored them in a repository that's called QB one so all we need to do is just copy this git clone command uh, now again i've actually already done this so let me just paste this in if I just call it QB1B, for example, what this will do is it'll just go on like, actually that's wrong, let me just, let me just do that again, QB1, if I just rename the existing QB1 to QB1 dash old, something like that. Right, let's try that again so what this is going to do this is going to go to github and it's going to download those files it's really quick because there's not very much to them they're just text files so if we look on here now we have the qb1 folder which is just this one here sort of in dark purple so Wayne said masking a service prevents the service from being started manually or automatically which is a strong stronger version of disable masking disables all sim links and specified files are removed awesome thank you for that Wayne that helps a lot right so next up let's see what we need to do now um, now we can this is an optional step um, the official um, ROS docker files are stored in this um, open source um, I mean let me just grab that and paste that up here because we can actually have a, a poke about and see what's going on here so oops we don't need that we just need that right here we go so yes these are the official docker images on github and they've got all kinds of configurations for ROS, ROS2, different platforms they've got tools like gazebo which is a tool for sort of visualizing things in 3d uh, and they've done all the hard work testing things out making sure things work properly so we're actually going to use that uh, as a basis for our own custom docker image so you can run that step if you want to just so that you've got them and you can have a look uh, but i think i'm actually going to skip that step on this particular one right so yes the open source robotics foundation uh, that's their their files there okay so we should have the the docker images and the qb1 i'm going to skip the docker images just because i've already done the hard work for you by testing these out on this particular build and we're now going to build our own container so this is what we're going to run within docker this is the the closed it's almost like a virtual machine but even more lightweight and to create that we have two things we have a docker file and the docker file will essentially contain all the instructions on how to build this container all the files that it needs to include and so on and the docker compose tells um, docker how to start this up and shut it down so it's a really sort of elegant way of bringing this up and bringing it down okay i'm just going to mute that uh, tab there because i can hear that notifications through from twitter and mastodon there right okay so this is what's actually inside the docker compose so you can see there it's got like a version number 3.9 you then define the services you can have multiple containers multiple things running there uh, and i've got a service i'm calling ros2 um, i've got an instruction there to build it if it isn't already built uh, i'm not having a restart policy at the moment so i've just commented that out and for the time being i've just opened up them ports them ports don't actually do anything right now but um, what i want to do eventually is i'll open those ports up so that the docker container can be accessed from outside from the outside world essentially now two important things that are on here um, docker enables you to map um, or bind local folders to within the uh, the container and that means that we can create files outside of the container and see them with inside the container and vice versa so this is really handy if we're doing some software development we want to have all our git files not just in the container but also outside of it as well uh, and it just makes it a lot easier to do that kind of development so i've got two here i've got one that i'm calling home slash kev slash ros so if your username isn't kev you need to put your username in there and ros is just the folder i've chosen to uh, to map everything that's in the local raspberry pi kev folder and then the other one is home slash kev slash qb1 which is that repository that we've just downloaded and i'm going to map that to ros2 in our container 
And then the last thing that's on here, if you've got one of these LiDAR devices, like I've got just uh, over here, which is sort of running around at the moment, I'll just slice that, you can actually stop this. Um, that, um, that actually exists, oops, let me just go back to uh, my terminal there. So that actually exists um, on TTY USB zero when I plug that in. So if I'm on the um, if I'm on QB one and I do a, an LS slash dev slash TTY USB zero, I'll see that the, that device is actually connected. Um, so if I want to have that appear inside the Docker container, uh, what I need to do is is I need to include that as a device. Uh, and then TTY is a way of um, making the the Docker container have a terminal, so it can it can spin off new terminal sessions, uh, and therefore you can connect to it. If you don't have that, it'll essentially just open up and then close, open up and then close, and just do that infinitely, which is a bit irritating. So you can see there, yes, we've got the two containers. Um, so what we are going to do, um, we are going to go back to our our terminal here. Uh, we are going to. Um, let me just see what we said there. So we're going to go to QB1 slash Docker and then we're going to do a Docker build. So let me just copy that. Let's go over here. So let's go into QB1. So CD to change directory to QB1. Let's do an LS to list what's in there. You can do LS dash L if you want to see it in sort of long form. And there's this folder here called Docker. So let's do CD Docker. Let's have a see what's in there. And there's two files. There is this Docker Compose and there's a Docker file. So if I if I type um, cat, this will catalog or essentially just show you what's inside the file. So if I just type Docker file, uh, you can see there. There's a whole load of uh, instructions. It starts over here, and it basically just says this is how you build um, this particular instance. So it's going to grab the Ros Humble Ros Core Jammy, which is a, a flavor of Ubuntu that's been custom made by the Open Source Robot Foundation. And we're gonna do all these other steps to it as well. So that's what's gonna happen uh, when we, we do Docker build. Okay, so I previously built this, so it didn't take any time at all, but um, it normally would take about maybe five minutes, depending on um, how fast your internet connection is. And what that will do, if we do um, Docker PS, uh, so image, ls we can see which uh, things we've actually built on here so this ros humble ros core jammy uh, that was that was in that docker file that was one of the first things it downloaded so that's 397 megabytes in size uh, and then there's two other ones that this is probably me just having a bit of a play here so docker underscore ros2 is an image that's been built you can see the images are exactly the same there so it's just got two with two different names within it um, but they're not being used they're, they're like an iso they're just like a flat file ready to be run um, and then when it's run it then becomes a container so currently these are just images ready to run so if we do docker ps we're actually not running any containers at the moment um, so what we can do now um, so there's a question there so let me just come back to this one somebody was asking about uh, what is tty usb zero so that is the the device on the, the LiDAR device, that's how it presents itself when you plug in your USB connection to your Raspberry Pi. Um, it's, it shows up as a, as a USB device and that just happens to be its name, TTY USB zero. Um, so we're not gonna use that today, that, that's, uh, but it does show up uh, if, you, if you run that. So next up, oops. I pressed the wrong button there. It's very sad music appeared. Uh, okay, so let's go back to uh, to here and let me see what we need to do next. So we've built the, um, we've, we've used the Docker build. So T means just give this a, a name, a title. So ROS2 is what we've called it. And the dot just means build in the current folder. So you can see there that we've got the output that we've just seen. And then the next step, it couldn't be simpler. Docker up, Docker compose up dash d so let's go over here and i'll tell you what this means so we have this docker compose file in fact let's let's have a look inside what that looks like so we do cat docker compose dot yaml uh, it's not very big the file so you can see there we've got those ports that we're not using we've got those two volumes that we're going to map within it and we've got the device um, now if I try running this, I'm going to show you what's going to happen. It's going to have an error because I've not got that you, that LiDAR device plugged into this second QB. Um, so I'll show you how we can fix this error. It's very, very simple. So if I do that, 
um, Docker compose up. Up will bring up the service. It will create a new container and it'll run it. And dash D just means do this detached. Don't, don't do it interactively. So you can see here it's saying that there's a problem. It cannot find this USB uh, zero device. So what I need to do is just for the for this particular tutorial, I'm just going to do uh, maybe I don't need to do sudo. Let's just do nano and then the name of that uh, compose file. So it's docker compose dot yaml. And essentially what we can do is just comment out these different things. There we go. So if I do that and I save that and I just bring that up, it should now bring up that new container. Done. So if I now do docker ps, we can now see that we've got a container running. So there we go, docker underscore ros, ros2 and the name of the, the actual um, container is docker underscore ros2 dash one. There we go. Okay, so let's go back to our notes and see what we need to do next. We've now got the, the container running, which is really cool. We've actually got a, a workable ROS environment now. Um, so the next thing that we can do, which is I think the coolest thing, you might not have seen this before, we can use Visual Studio Code on different computer and we can then remotely connect to that Raspberry Pi and we can even connect into that container from Visual Studio. So if I just load up Visual Studio, let me just get this uh, in the right environment. So let me, let me close that one down there. Okay. Okay, so let me start this from scratch. If I do a new window, and what I need to do is make sure that I've got some extensions installed. So if I just type in Docker up here. I've actually got these already installed, but Docker, we need to make sure that that one's installed. You'll see a little blue button like that to install it. And then Docker Explorer by uh, Junhan, you ought to want to install that as well. And they're very, very quick to install. And once we've got those two installed, uh, the next thing we need to make sure that we've got installed, I think it's called Remote, uh, Remote SSH and Remote Explorer, both by Microsoft. Uh, so you can trust them. Again, they'll have the little blue install button. If you click on those two, uh, let them install, you'll then be able to do the next step and you'll see that this little green button appears down here. Okay, so let's uh, let's just get rid of that. And what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to now press Shift, Control and P. Oh, is it Command and P? Shift, Command and P. And you can see there, it's actually got this recently used remote SSH. But if I just type remote, um, you'll see that that sort of pops up SSH. And I want to connect to a new SSH host. So let's just... Uh, do that. It then wants to have a, it wants to know what the IP address and the, the username is. So I'm going to type in kev at 192.168.1.204 or 205. And it's saying um, it cannot, con cannot establish that. Let me try, let me try 204 instead. So again, shift, command, and P. Uh, let's do remote SSH. Let's do Pi at, uh, it's not pi, is it? That's probably why it went wrong. Kev at 192.168.1.204. And we know it will work. There we go. It's now asking for the password. So I'm just going to type in the password there. And you can see there at the bottom, it's given us a bit of an update opening remote. So Visual Studio is now connecting to that Raspberry Pi, which is pretty cool. And it's also downloading and installing this VS Code server on the Pi, so like a really small plugin just to make this work. Right, we're now connected to that Pi. We can actually test this out. I'm uh, on a Mac here, so if I do new terminal, uh, you'll actually see it says QB2. So we, we can see here we're on QB2. And we can type various different commands. Did you know there's a command that's called pinout on Raspberry Pis? And if you type that and you scroll up a little bit, it gives you a little picture of the Raspberry Pi that you're connected to. So you can see this one is a Raspberry Pi 4B, 1.5 and it also has 8 gigs of RAM which is cool and uh, you can see everything else as well like which uh, it's got Wi-Fi enabled it's also got the Ethernet enabled running at a gigabit and there are all the uh, the pinouts as well and what the GPIO is there so that's just pinout uh, which is quite useful and if you want to check which architecture you're on if you do uname dash m you can see there Arch 64, which means running the 64-bit version of Raspberry Pi OS. Okay, so that's the first bit. If I now click on this uh, open, I can open a folder on the uh, the Raspberry Pi, which is pretty cool. So if I go to QB, 
and I'd open that. I think it opens up another window and just asks you for your password again, which is a little bit irritating, but I think you can uh, you can put up with that. And then, yes, I'm going to trust the authors of these folders, so it's fine. So here we go. So next up, um, we can check to see have we got those uh, extensions installed. So let me just make sure we've got those Docker extensions because I, I expect to see... There we go. So if I do install in SSH, <laughs> this is pretty cool, and then install in SSH for the Docker Explorers. That means we've now got this little Docker thing down here as well. But if I just go back to the regular Explorer window, look what appears. We have all these extra little drop downs and there is the container um, that that we set up. You can even right click on this and you can you can inspect it and so on. And you can even execute in bash. So I'm now inside the container running in Docker, running on that Raspberry Pi remotely, but I'm accessing it through my Mac. So this is pretty cool. So if I do LS, we can see there we've got ROS2. We've got the, um, if I do home, do LS, we've got the ROS folder as well, which we created. And these are mapped to um, the other folders outside of the, the container. So if I go back here, go to ROS2, we should see all those QB files and there they all are. Okay, cooking with gas. So it's nearly time to write our first program. So we've done quite a few different steps here. We've installed these um, uh, uh, extensions to Visual Studio Code and we've remotely connected to uh, the Raspberry Pi. If you want to know what the Raspberry Pi IP address is, another thing you can type in is just IP A, uh, IP space A, and there's loads of things here. But if you basically just type the second one, you can see there what your IP address is. So 205, and I think I've got the wireless LAN, and that's 204. So that's why I've got those two, 204, 205. The other ones are all IP6. You can basically just ignore them. Docker will also create its own virtual. Um, network cards as well if it needs to um, but uh, we don't need those for now so yeah you can just do IPA to get all that information up there okay let's jump back to the tutorial we're following and yes we're so we're remotely connected we've found a folder which is the QB1 and now we can we can play around we've even uh, connected to that um, that container as well I just did right click execute a bash command if you want to do that from the terminal you can just type in docker exec dash it which is like an interactive terminal the name of the container which is docker underscore ros2 dash one underscore one and then bash which is just the shell you could do sh zsh or whatever you got installed uh, but bash is born again shell uh, that's what we want and uh, yes we've now got congratulations you've got your ros2 container set up on your raspberry pi using it um, through visual studio code remotely which is pretty cool Okay, it's time to write our first program. It's not a very complicated program. It's really unimpressive, but it is a ROS program. So we're going to do this. So one of the things that we will have to do when we log into our container is we need to source. We need to basically just run loads of... Um, we, 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 let me just get this right. We need to run um, a one script that will run several commands to set all the environment variables that we need to access. So let's go back to our Visual Studio code. What I'm going to do is just make this screen a bit bigger so we can see what's going on. Like so. And let's just open it up a little bit as well. So if I go over here and I type in ROS2, which is one of the commands that we want to, to run, at the moment it says command not found. It doesn't understand what ROS2 is. And that's because we haven't sourced um, the first setup file. So again, this is in the tutorial. So if you if you don't if you can't remember this, so what we need to do is type source, and then we need to type in opt, which is like optionally install files. And then if I just press tab, it'll fill out the next couple of folders for me. So ros and humble, humble hawks bill. That's what it is. Is the name of the uh, the version of ros that we're running. And we then want to run setup dot bash. Oop bash. Um, it doesn't look like it's done anything. We can have a look what's actually inside that file. So if we do opt and then setup.bash, you can see there it essentially just sets up some environment variables. This a aimant shell, aimant is like the build um, environment build tool for bash, for ROS, sorry. And it's setting up a few um, 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 path settings as well. Now, if we just type in ROS2 now, it works because it understands where that command is and how to access it. So 
ROS2 is the, is the, the new way of running uh, things like, um, you know, we can check to see uh, are there any, any nodes. So currently we haven't got any nodes. Is it node? There we go, node list. So we haven't got any nodes currently running, so there shouldn't be anything there. ROS2 packages. So is it package list? There should be quite a few packages on there. Uh, there they all are. These are the sort of standard ones that you get with it. We'll have a look what they do in a future episode. But the first step was to basically get our environment sorted. Um, so what we want to do next is there's a command that's called colcon, which is, um, let's go to our our uh, thing here and it'll tell us about how to, to run Colcon and what Colcon is. It's collective construction. So Colcon is a command line tool that improves the workflow of building, testing and using multiple software packages, automates the process, handles the ordering and setting up of environment variables. Essentially this does all the hard work for us. When we create a source file, we just do Colcon build and it will take that source file, compile it, set up some additional um, setup.bash files so that we can have a uh, source files for that specific application that we're writing and uh, it'll do all that for us so it's a really nice quite powerful tool so we've we've done the first one we've run the um, the sourcing of the script uh, the next step is to create a workspace so let's go and do that now so we can either do that um let's do that from visual studio actually right so i've already created a, a folder here called first app i'm just going to rename that so I just move first app to um, old app and then let's just pretend that we didn't have that so let's do make directory first app and we're going to go into our first we're going to change so mkdir is make directory make folder and then we're going to change the directory into first app and then we're going to make another folder which we're going to call src which is source and then inside our source uh, I'm not going to create anything in it yet, but I'm just going to create a file that's called talker.python. Um, so if I do ls to list, I can see talker.python's there, but it actually hasn't got any length. It's, there's nothing in it. There's just an empty file of zero length. Okay, so if I now go dot dot, and I do ls again. So we've got a single folder that's called source that's got a single file in it that's called talker.py that doesn't do anything just yet. But if I do colcon build what this will do is it will create all the files and folders that we need to create a, a ros workspace so if i now do ls we've now got build install log and source so let's have a look inside build let's go into our build folder look in there so there's a colcon underscore ignore if i come back out and i look in the install one there's a few things in here look it's created all these local setup setup.bash and these are the files that we need to run. We need to source them if we're going to use our, um, we want to use our own application within ROS. So if I do setup.bash to source that, again, that will just redirect some of the local variables so that things work properly. Okay, and then we have the log folder as well. So we look in there, let's do dash L. You can see there the, the latest version, there's a link to that. Uh, it's got this build file here, let's do Let's just have a look in there. And then let's have a look at uh, events. Is there anything in events? Nope. Um, there we go. So a timer, event reactor shutdown. <laughs> Sounds like a nuclear power station. Um, okay, so we're now back into the root of our first application. So what we can do, we can actually open up that file that we've just created. Um, but there's a step that we probably need to do first. So if I go to that first app, I go to that source folder and I open up talker.py and I'm just going to just do a one comment, which is just hello. It's come up with an error message there saying it cannot write to that file. If I just move me out of the way for a second, see there, unable to write to the local file talker.py, permissions are denied. So we just need to fix that. So if we go back to our terminal, just go one folder beneath our folder, which is the first app. And then we just need to change the mode. I'm just going to do 777. It's probably not recommended to do it that way. Dash R, which means do this recursively. And then first app. So if I now go into first app again, you can see now that instead of being um, blue, which represents like a folder, it's now green, which means we can write to these folders as well. So if I now go back up here 
and let me just retry that now it'll now succeed because um, we've now got the right permission so Unix has got some pretty weird old-fashioned ways of doing permissions um, and essentially it's like user group and world there's like three different uh, groupings if you do if you go down here and do ls-l you've got these things here these actually are the, the three pairings so you've got your local user permissions your group permissions that the user might be a member of and then you've got the world permissions which are these last ones here so if you're on a unix multiple user system um, everyone is a member of world so what can they see and then the d is just if it's a directory or not so this uh, change mode 777 effectively changes the the these bits here if i if i change that for example to um 666 which is usually the, the the way it normally creates these oops i just need to do that from there and then i go back into first app you can see now the 666 it's got rid of the execute permission from each of these folders so we need to make sure that we have that let's go back and change that to 777 again and this is the sort of they call them the file modes it's an old-fashioned unixy thing okay but yeah we need to set them and it says that in our tutorial as well so if we go back over here um, after the thing about colcon and setting up our script there's a little bit there about fixing the permissions right let's write our talker.py <laughs> so i've got some code here we're going to basically just cut and paste this and i'm going to talk you through how this works um, but essentially this is going to create our first um, program so let me just get rid of that hello paste this in i'm just going to move the window down a bit so we can see what's going on so the first thing these th first two things are just uh, comments uh, we're going to import this uh, rclp pi so rcl is the the ros um like common libraries and then the pi is the, the python version of these common libraries so we're going to import that and then from common um from rcl pi dot node we're going to import node which is a class and then we've we've got this this function here which is called by you'll see this in loads of different python programs so if underscore or double underscore name double underscore look all these dunders double underscore is equal to double underscore main double underscore then run the main function um, and it's just a way of saying if if the person runs this and hasn't specified any sort of thing to run within the file then just run this main function here so we're going to pass in a variable that's called args if there's no arguments are actually being passed we can just set that to none and we will actually use this later on in some of the tutorials um, to pass in additional variables uh, and settings so by basically setting that to none it means that we can have these accepted for future so we're then going to do the rclpy.init we're going to initialize uh, ros we're going to pass it any arguments that have been passed in to us we're then going to create a new node and the node is going to be called pytest pi underscore test we're then going to get a logger and the logger is going to log um, an entry and it's going to log the entry as an info type um, this is similar if you've used few uh, there's a logging function in there and we're basically just going to say hello ros2 now the next two commands are important because what this will do is it this will spin up the node it'll make it appear if we do ros2 node list we will see it listed there and we'll give this a go in a minute and then that spin will carry on so it won't actually get this to the shutdown command it'll carry on until we press ctrl and c and then it'll run the shutdown command and basically just tell um tell ros and anything that's connected to it that this particular node is going to, to die okay so let us go down here let's have a look in our source folder let's see that it's there talker.py let's just make sure it can see the same thing and there it is there's all the code that we've just written up here because we've mapped the folders outside and inside the containers everything we do here is instantaneously available here so i'm going to do cd dot dot so i'm now in if i do pwd it gives us the um the current working directory uh, which is ros2 first app and we need to run colcon build because we've changed the file and that will then create the packages or anything else that's in there uh, now if we go back into our uh, build folder i think it is 
nope, must be the install folder. Uh, let's just run setup.bash. And what I'm also going to do is um, I'm going to create another terminal instance so that we've got two of them. Um, is it going to let me do that there? Probably not. I'll probably have to create another terminal. So just to the side where I am here, there's actually two windows that we can switch between. So if I go there, I might be able to execute a second bash instance there. It's actually just switched back to the other one. Don't worry about that just now. I will I will connect to this um, a second time because I want to show you that you can actually see the node running. That's what I'm trying to show you here. So what we'll do, we'll go back into the uh, source folder and then we'll just do Python 3 and then talker.py. And this is our first program running in ROS. So it's not very impressive, but it is a ROS program. So what's happened here is we've got the, the logger has logged out an info um, event. There's the timestamp of when that happened. The node is called pi underscore test. So pi underscore test node has said hello ROS2, which is there. And you can see there that it's continuing to run. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go back to that other terminal that I've got just here. And I'm going to do docker run interactive terminal. Uh, is it run exec? And then it's called docker ROS2 underscore one and then bash. So I'm now in a second terminal. The other one is still running. If I go back over to the right here, just behind my face, you can see that one's still running. So if I now go back over here, we need to do that source thing again, where we source the, uh, the opt, the humble and the setup.bash. We can actually add that to a, um, a profile so that we don't have to keep doing this every single time. It's very straightforward to do this. And now if I do ROS2 node list, we can see PyTest is running as a node. So that means that um, ROS is running and um, there is one node running in ROS. So if I go back over to here and I kill that now, so if I do command and C to kill it and I go back over to our first one, if I run node ROS2 node list, you can see that there's now no nodes running because it's shut down, it's run that last command there. So this is how we can set up and create a very first program that doesn't do anything really exciting, doesn't do anything robotically just yet. Um, but this is how we, we need to set this up. And this is pretty much boilerplate for every app that we will write, every um, node that we will create. So we can copy this and we can put this in something like um, I use gists on GitHub. If I go back over here, I just open up uh, gists.github and I go for, let me see new node. Um, I basically just created there that exact boilerplate text. So I can, it means I can use that um, as like a, a, a scratch a scratch pad somewhere to put bits and pieces. So it's like a mini version of a, a Git repository. So that's just called gists, gist.github.com to grab that. Okay, let's get back over to our first program. And that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover off today from this particular point of view. The next part of the tutorial will, will teach us how to do something a bit more interesting and we'll get into depth with a lot more ROS concepts. So today we've seen the logger, we've, we've looked at creating a node, um, but we haven't really done any sort of intercommunication between different nodes. So the next thing we'll create is like a listener that can listen out for things and then respond back to them. And then we'll look at building things like getting the motors to work, getting some odometry. If we have, um, my intention is to get this robot that I have here and this has, um, it has a dedicated motor 2040, which is actually running on MicroPython. And it can get really detailed odometry from these, uh, these motors. They've got a tiny little um, encoder on the back and they can position very, very accurately. So um, currently these are out of stock from the supplier, from Pimeroni. So um, I'll either have to take these off and fit them or I'll just have to wait for them to come into stock. But that's essentially what I want to do. I want to create, get one of these boards and fit this and have this communicate to nodes um, to essentially to the Raspberry Pi 4 and there can be a node that's listening to that odometry data and then it can put it in as a, a separate node, an odometry node, put that into the ROS ecosystem and then we can take that data and visualize it and so on. Okay, so let me uh, 
So there's another, um, Shemi's just uh, given us another tip there, which is if you do exclamation mark, exclamation mark, that doesn't seem to do anything. It says it repeats the previous command. Let me just clear that. If I, what would I need to do to prove that? If I do slash slash, it doesn't seem to do anything, but maybe it's just doing the previous command. So if I do echo hello, and then I do slash slash. Oh yes, there it is. So it's running the previous command. That's pretty cool. I did not know that. So if you do that, that, and then control. I was trying to see how you could uh, do something useful with that, but that's pretty cool. You can just do up arrow as well. <laughs> that works just the same. Or you can type two characters and then press enter, or just one. That's cool. Okay, so let me get back to the slides. So, so we've installed our 64-bit version of ROS. We've set up our our Docker environment. We've built our own ROS2 container um, using that Docker file and Docker Compose. And we've set up Visual Studio Code so that we can connect to that running container from a separate computer, which means we can use all the power and functionality of Visual Studio Code to write our code. Uh, and we're not sort of limited by the, the you know limited processing power that we have on the Raspberry Pi 4 there by comparison. And then we wrote our very first ROS program. It's a little bit underwhelming, I'm sure, but um, we will get onto some much more advanced programs in the future. So if you like what I do and you want to see more of these types of videos, please give me a like, drop me a comment, uh, let me know if this is something that you are interested in doing, whether you've used ROS before, maybe you're a ROS expert and you can give me some tips. Um, and uh, if you've not already subscribed to the channel, definitely make sure you click that subscribe button and um, that really help the channel to grow. Make sure you switch on the notifications as well. I do go live every single Sunday at 7pm GMT, so if you want to catch me live, that's how you can do that. And if you've not joined our, our Discord group, you can uh, you can do that too. But before we get onto our Discord group, I want to show you um, the, the robot as it is now. So here is our QB. So this is, it's currently got its LiDAR plugged in and running. So you can see there, but the wheels at the moment um, are not connected up. The, the motors are in place, but essentially these are not uh, screwed up and powered up yet. But I have got all the, the, the pieces ready to go. I just move this round. So this back piece, for example, that simply just screws into place just there. And there's two screws to, to hold that in place. There's a side piece that goes there when I've not got these wires plugged in. It's on sort of life support at the moment. And there's another one at the front there that can uh, that can go just onto the front there as well. So all the pieces are now 3D printed. I did have to print another little piece, a little spacer that goes around the very top there, this little blue piece. And that was because I've not allowed enough space for this little wheel, this motor in here. And what was happening is it was it was essentially doing that and stopping the LiDAR from spinning around. Uh, and that's just like a rubber band that's just uh, spinning around there. But that's been happily running now for quite a while. And the other thing I want to do is uh, upgrade this camera at some point as well. So this is currently running um, an Argicam 16 megapixel camera and I'm having a few problems getting that set up, set up and running so uh, watch this space on that one. Okay so that's uh, that's the the demo so far from the where we're up to with the robot and as I was saying if you've not joined our discord server then you need to head over to kevsrobots.com slash discord it's completely free and uh, we can sort of hang out share pictures if you have any problems with the code that I've shared you can also help me uh, bug fix that and uh, get to the problem of any troubles that you might be having it's much easier to do that on discord than uh, through youtube or through messenger or something like that if it's on discord everybody else can see as well and they can jump in if you want to follow me on social media so i'm all over social media if um, you want to check out my new tiktok page you can check that out uh, just go to kevin mclear 6 and you can see some videos i've been making um, i made a few about uh, qb and uh, there's been a few other ones on there one of them has done ridiculously well i think it had over 400,000 views when i last looked at it let me just uh, find it on TikTok. I don't know why that particular one did so well. Yes, I had 432,000 views. And then there's another one of me going into the Raspberry Pi store in Cambridge, and that's had 114,500 views, which is pretty crazy. And the other ones have just done, like, averagely well. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on there. Also on Instagram, uh, Kevin McAleer. On Twitter, at Kev's Mac. And um, I'm also on uh, Mastodon, Kevsmac as well. So Kevsmac at Mastodon Social. So make sure you follow me on all those places and 
definitely say hi. Uh, that'd be that'd be pretty cool. And if you want to support the show, there's a number of different ways that you can do that. So you can do a super thanks. So once you've um, joined the channel, uh, you've subscribed, you'll see that there is a, a super thanks button. If you're watching this live on the, the live stream, you can do a super th uh, chat and that will pop up. Um, I can now enable all the uh, stream element stuff on here. Let me just click that button there. And if you want to buy a coffee, you can do, you can go to kesrobots.com slash coffee. And if you want to join the YouTube membership program as well, you can do that it's about the price of a coffee. It's not very expensive, but it helps support the show, keeps me in robots and uh, me creating videos for you. Okay, let me just uh, click on the next thing. So yes, the supporters, the most important part. Let me uh, get over to that. So we've got a number of people who've helped support the show so far. And these people are, so we've got Mark Hampson, we've got David Redding, we have Shumi, we've got Derek, we've got RGS, we've got Roland, we have Bill, Alex. We have Tom Weiser, who just uh, subscribed for another year, which is fantastic. Thank you for that, Tom. That really, you're one of the longest supporters, I think, of the channel, so particularly thanks for that. We've got Anthony R. Hollins as well, who's uh, recently subscribed. We've got Keith, uh, we have Shemi, we have Steve Phillips. And then on the YouTube uh, members on that side, we have Fred uh, more we've got Bill Hoy we've got Dale from Hybrid Robotics we've got Hans from Cheerlights oh, look we've got uh, a super chat coming in there from Laurie thank you so much uh, for that thanks for the Pico stands awesome I'm really pleased that you like those see so, yes, I've got a number of uh, Pico stands um, I've not got any to hand actually there's one at the back of the room over there I'll come to that in a minute <laughs> so we've got Michael we have Fraser we have uh, Jose we've got uh, um, Joanne we have uh, Jean-Paul and we've got Tom as well and if I'm mashing your name there let me know I like to get people's names right it's the most important word in anybody's vocabulary cool okay so that's the uh, the main content of the show so um, we're going to do a bit of a live stream hangout now so this is the point in the video where I'll say if you're watching this on replay thank you so much for watching and I shall see you next time